Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Anna Summers, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar will be on January 27th, Optimizing Your Searches on the Internet. It's more than family search and ancestry with Maureen Brady. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Dave Obi, who will be giving a presentation on changing places, changing borders, overcoming geographic challenges. And Dave Obi is a journalist and genealogical researcher who has written a dozen books and given more than 600 presentations at conferences and seminars in Canada, the United States, and Australia since 1997. He is editor and publisher of the Times Colonist Daily Newspaper in Victoria, British Columbia. He has worked as a journalist in British Columbia and Alberta since 1972 and has been researching family history since 1978. In 2012, Dave was awarded an honorary doctorate of laws by the University of Victoria for his work as a historian, genealogist, and journalist. He was a member of the Services Consultation Committee at Library and Archives Canada in Ottawa for four years. Dave is a columnist for Internet Genealogy Magazine and Your Genealogy Today Magazine, formerly Family Chronicle. And Dave, if you're ready, we'll turn the time over to you. Thank you. Just get the uh, screen sharing started here and off we go. Again, I'm, I'm Dave Obi from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, most of the, um, uh, the examples I have in this, in this presentation today are from Eastern Europe, where there's been a lot of changes of borders over the years, but the basic principles apply to anywhere in the world, you know, anywhere that you, that you have research of any sort. Um, the, some, of the, some of the things that I'll be talking about can apply where, where you are. There is a handout for the uh, for the talk today. Uh, go to daveobi.com and click on the link. It's just under the name of this session. You'll see the link that says handout, and uh, there you go. Um, I leave those up for about uh, for about 24 hours. Very quickly, every everywhere in the world has seen major major changes in boundaries over over the years, um, no, no matter what the country is. In Canada alone. I've counted more than 50 major boundary changes since the uh, first you know, colonizers and settlers came here from Europe. Um, this is what, what Canada looked like when, when it was uh, first a country in 1867, much, much smaller than it is today. The rest was British North America, still under sort of direct rule from, from, from London. Um, there were only four provinces in Canada at the time, and two of them were much, much smaller than they are today. By 1911, things had changed dramatically, but Ontario, Quebec, and Manitoba were still much smaller than they are. Newfoundland was not yet a part of the country, and the boundary between the Northwest Territories and the Yukon um, had, was not in its current location. And also the, the new, the Northwest Territories had not been split up uh, into, um, that didn't happen until the 1990s when it became two separate uh, territories. So it does happen everywhere. Every country has seen this kind of thing. I, just, I don't. I, I I can look across the uh, the, um, the the strait from where I live and see Washington, which used to be Washington Territory, and so on and so on and so on. Things change all the time, and we think that things are sort of stable, but look at all the changes in our lifetimes. Look at all that we've seen in terms of boundary changes in our lifetimes. It's incredible how many countries have changed, um, and and internal divisions have changed. Um, within a country, there could be local local governments are, are amalgamated, um, country, uh, counties reallocated, so on and so on. Um, happens all the time. So you have to know how to deal with this when you're doing research. And a good example of, of some of the changes, the end of communism in the late 1980s um, resulted in major, major changes, including the reunification of Germany. And signs like this, you will see along, all along the autobahns in Germany where the old border was, the, 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 the border between East and West Germany, uh, which was a, 
you know, a major factor in the lives of many people, including my own relatives. And go back to, to 1942, this I got from a Rand McNally atlas uh, that I picked up showing uh, Germany much different because it included at the time, because it was the war, but it was the Nazi years, it included uh, Austria, it included uh, um, the, the Czech Republic. Uh, Poland was pushed further over. There was a, there was a bit of Germany where, where, but, but that's now in Russian territory and, and Polish territory and so on. You look at some countries like, uh, like England, which have had, you know, the boundaries, the external boundaries have been, have been stable. You look at the internal boundaries and all of the county changes that were made um, in the 1970s. Like it, wherever you go, you'll find this kind of thing. Consider, consider what Ukraine looked like until March, 2013 when uh, the Russians basically seized the Crimea, which is the, the area at the very, very bottom there. Um, and who knows what Ukraine will look like a year from now, given all the pressures that are building up um, along the border right now. And the fact that the West is looking at ways to protect Ukraine um, in case there's a Russian invasion. The, um, the Eastern parts of Ukraine um, are more sympathetic to the Russians and probably and, and and some people they would probably be, be quite happy to join Russia. The West they don't want that. So there is divisions. There's not unanimity within the country in terms of what might happen there. And then you consider years and years ago what a place looked like. Uh, this this is from a, a Ukrainian historical atlas that I picked up when I was there a few years ago, showing different regions and the names they had at the time. Some of the, these names. Um, actually carried down to this day. The, the names that were in use uh, basically, you know, 10 centuries ago are, 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 still in, are still in play. I'll give you a few examples here of what you might deal with. Uh, the first one is the ancestral home of my Scheffler family, which was in, which was in, um, in uh, uh, East Prussia. The town was called Albrechtsdorf. I've been there a few times just to, to check on it. It's an interesting location, um, easy to find once, once you start looking for it under the Polish name because it's now part of Poland. All of the German residents of Albrechtsdorf were forced to leave after the Second World War. So when I go back there, I don't find any relatives, even though that's my ancestral village, they're all gone. Um, they have all, they, they scattered into, into uh, Germany, North America, wherever they could find a new home. And one of the theories behind moving at, after the war was when people were sort of forced out of their own home, they were now living somewhere else in, you know, in, in Western Germany. They weren't at home anymore. So, so to them, it seemed like a good time to maybe head across the ocean to Canada or the USA, simply because they, they, they were on the move anyway, they had to, had to get established somewhere else. Germany was in, still in turmoil and a lot of rebuilding was needed, so they felt just keep on going further west or somewhat to Australia. The, uh, the old Lutheran church, um, my family appears in records there for, for, uh, for two centuries. After the war, the, uh, the church was taken over by the Catholics uh, because all of the Poles who were being moved into that, that, that village from eastern parts of Poland to replace the Germans who had been forced out they, all those Poles were Catholic. So the Lutheran church became a Catholic church and simply carried on. And the name, the name of, the, of the village is now Wojciechi, um, Albrechtsdorf effectively um, translated. The location is interesting. It's, 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 you'll see the, um, the uh, sort of reddish pinkish dot at the very, very bottom of the screen. That is where Albrechtsdorf is. Um, further up, you'll see the, the, the a line close to the top, across the top there, that, 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 that is the border between Poland and Russia. I had, I had ancestral villages throughout that area. About 80% of them are on the, the, um, the Polish side, 20% are on the Russian side, and that border is a huge, huge obstacle in terms of me going into, into Russia to see those, those villages. I have not been there yet. Um, someday I'll screw up my courage and I'll go, but, but it's, it's quite a hassle to get into that, that area. It takes hours to get, get permission. You need the visa and so on to you want to visit your, visit your, your, your villages. But all of that used to be 
communities, free travel back and forth between these different communities. Now there's a border in between you cannot cross. And even if you do cross, you will not find any of my relatives there anymore. They've all gone. They've all been, been forced to leave. Uh, the, the, the town of Albrechtsdorf um, was in Preussisch Eilau, which is, was close to the center of the north, north to south center, whatever, of, um, of Ostpreussen, East Prussia. Um, and you can see how the, the, the county was split between uh, Russia at the top and Poland at the bottom when they created the, the uh, Kaliningrad, Kaliningrad um, Oblast or, uh, at the end of the Second World War, when that became Russian territory. And, and that, that is now separated from sort of mainland Russia, for want of a better term, the same way that Alaska is separated from the states. There's, a, there's another country in between. Uh, the 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 um, the main center, uh, Preussisch Eilau, which now has a Russian name, has had that Russian name since the, since the 1940s, something along the line of Bagrationovsk. Um, it's just north of the border. You can you can see that the border is, is sort of the the, the 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 broken line or the the the, the bended line, whatever, across the bottom. Uh, that is the border. You can be so so close to it um when, when you're when you're uh, when you're there um when you get to the border you can't see the, the city but but it's, it's just right across the way and i've been to the border the the the, uh, the sign says republic of poland state border crossing prohibited this is a back road it used to be a main road but it's, it was closed off the main road is further to the east and when i was there i could hear um I could hear dogs barking on the other side. I could hear activity on the other side through the woods. Um, I didn't venture onto that across the border. I, I, I wasn't sure, you know, at what point those, go, those dogs would be unleashed, what point I'd trigger sensors or whatever. That's as close as I got to the border, um, knowing that I had, you know, ancestral areas on, just on the other side there. Uh, but, you know, at the time chose not to cross, did not have a visa and would only get in trouble if I, if I was caught. Um, the spot I was was um, was very very close. That's the back road. The, 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 the again the dot shows where where I was to take that photograph. The the main road is is further to the east, and um, I checked with the with the uh, security or the, or the the border security people. They told me don't get excited, don't go over there because there's no sign that says you know welcome to Russia or whatever. There's nothing like that. Nothing to take a photograph of. Please don't go there. And the reason I was talking to them was because um, they were they were after me. As soon as I as soon as I got close to that border, I had I, I had border police uh, security security police coming in to to talk to me and find out what I was doing. And uh, they they were quite concerned that I might be might be smuggling something. I might be doing something, trying to get someone across the border this way or that, etc. So they had to search the car, that kind of thing, to make sure that I wasn't up to anything funny. Um, so they, they are watching. Poland is watching very, very carefully to make sure that nobody is coming in from Russia, um, because the people coming in from Russia could be refugees. It could also be people, uh, you know, trying to destabilize Poland. Who knows? It's, you get into the politics of the area, and it's amazing what you find. Even even the the village of of Albrechtsdorf, now now Wojciechy, the um, a few years ago there was a story um, that I found through Google News. Uh, about how some some Russian fighters fighter jets had gone off course and flew quite low over Wojciechy, which caused a massive panic in the town because people felt that the Russians were invading. You realize how how nerves are are, are sort of on edge over there when you're when you're dealing with people that close to a border and bad feelings between the two countries. Another experience I had was further over to the to the uh, to the west. This was the main uh, hi highway between basically Berlin and, and Königsberg, which is now um, Kaliningrad in Russia, uh, built in the 1930s. Um, I've seen different accounts, whether they were, it was ever a four lane road or not, but it is a marvelously straight road that, uh, that leads you know, through Poland up into the Kaliningrad area, but it was closed off when I was there. I took this photograph from on top of a, a, an overpass and uh, because the overpass, you know, they still have overpasses along the road, et cetera, et cetera. I took it from there and um, I tripped when I was coming, when I was 
um, walking down in the heavy, thick grass from the top of the overpass. And as luck would have it, um, the security people came along. As I was sitting on the pavement, trying to figure out where I was bleeding and what, if I'd broken anything, so I fell thoroughly down the, down the slope. Uh, they came along and, and demanded to see my, my passport, demanded to see everything, search the car, et cetera, et cetera. They were quite upset that I'd, that I'd taken a photograph there. Um, and again, um, had to sort of get across. I'm not doing anything illegal here. I'm just, I'm just a, a dumb person from North America doing family history. You know, I just want to see what it looks like. Uh, but they were, they were quite upset and they warned me, do not go up that road no matter what. Don't go up there, you'll get arrested. Um, all of this, of course, being done through my Polish is non existent. Their English was, was semi there, but still, I, I got the message fairly, fairly quickly. Since then, however, things have changed. That's a modern look at the road. This is from Google, uh, Google Maps, a modern look at the road uh, to, to exactly the same, same location. And if you look on, like again, on the, on, the, on the satellite view, you'll see that they're, they have now opened up that road again properly, and there's a full border control station there. Um, and crossing the borders, by the way, is it, it's, it's between different countries such as those. It can be interesting. We're, we're used to, to Western Europe where you can cross without even thinking. Um, plan for about three hours to cross anywhere into Russia, into Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's quite a challenge. Some of the people who migrated after the Second World War, uh, my family was in a German colony in, um, in Ukraine. My, my mother, my grandparents brought my mother out in 1928, but many, many relatives were still in that German colony in Ukraine. They all had to get to German territory towards the end of the war or else they'd be sent to Kazakhstan. The ones who didn't get out were sent to Kazakhstan. Um, the ones who did get out had to scramble. And if they found themselves after the war in Russian territory, they had to figure out what to do at that point to, 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 because they knew that, you know, they, have a, they were born in Russia, they'll be taken back to Russia. So, so they had to, had to scramble, quite a problem. But you look at, the, at, at how the migration after the war, it was all forced migration effectively. Very few people were willing to, to, to lose their homes, uh, but massive numbers of people had to be moved this way and that because of the changes in borders, the changes in the governments and so on. It was very messy, a lot of confusion at the time. A lot of people effectively got lost from their families. Uh, in some cases, um, it, it took about 20 years for, for, for one, of my, my, um, one of my grandmother's cousins to find her again because, because everything was just lost, all information was lost and so on, all contact was, was given up. But it, it affected so much. It affected, affected all the people there in, in one form or another. Um, just down the road from Albrechtsdorf is a town called Borken. Um, and in my family history, there were people who, you know, relatives, you know, cousins, siblings, et cetera, who were married, died, et cetera, in Borken. And this is what the church looks like now. And it's, it's just a little town off, off the beaten path. Um, it's kind of a, a scary spot to go to because when you, when you, when you, when you arrive in Bork and you're the first person, you know, in that town from, from the West, probably in a decade. And they all look at you and stare and you figure, am I going to get out of here alive? But they were, the people were all friendly. You know, after you get, get through that, that initial sort of, if, if you've seen too many bad movies, et cetera, you'll, you'll figure, okay, I got a problem here. But in reality, the people were very friendly and quite helpful once they knew what I was after, which was, where's the Lutheran church? Um, again, back to the, to the, to the, the, uh, the border, the, the fact that the, the, the border between the two Germanies was, uh, was, uh, has, was obliterated basically. Um, after reunification of the, of the countries, um, but um, until that point, there were there were there was a lot of uh, a lot of problems created by that border as people tried to get across one side to the other, as people had relatives on on two different sides. Um, many people in my family were affected by that. I had many on the east, many on the west, and uh, and when they finally got together, many many years later, they were strangers effectively. This is the um, the um, the birth record from Russia for my mother's cousin Alice, um, born in 1927, and so she was just celebrated. Yet another birthday. She's 94 years old and still still alive and kicking. Uh, she she saw more misery in the first um, 25 years of her life than anyone should ever be expected to see. 
in terms of um, killings, uh, mass starvation, um, the force to flee again and again from one spot to another, that kind of thing. But um, she's still, she's still um, a great resource for me in terms of doing research. And this is what she looks like now, what she looked like as a kid. The reason I'm mentioning this is because after the war, she and her mother and her grandmother, and her grandmother is my great grandmother, all found themselves in a town in what became East Germany, the town of Balo, Balof, whatever. Um, and it, it was it was it was on the uh, the the East German side, as I say, the border very very close to the to the to to the area. So so you know they could almost reach out and touch basically uh, Hamburg that kind of thing. But it was on the wrong side of the border, and they had to do something. They they were all born in Russia, and if they were found there, they would have to be they would be sent back and into Kazakhstan, and who knows what would happen. So they had to do something to get out of there. And um, the from from the from the the the, the town of of uh, Balov, which is close to Ludwig's list, the uh, uh, Alice did whatever she could to find out how to get across that border. And the relevant thing is that she was not even twenty at the time, um, as she as she was doing all of this 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 um, you know finding all the information, and she she traded a loaf of bread to someone. Who gave her information on how to get across the border um and then she crossed late one night um to confirm it was it could be done i asked her what it was like to cross the border how did you get across safely you know basically you you, you there was a the field that she had to run across the field was all in the open and if you could hear the guns shooting in, in, in a distance you would run across that field hope for the best if they were if they were close by if, if the shots were close by you would go for it and wait for another night it's, it was as bad as that i don't know exactly where she crossed she can't she doesn't remember exactly where she crossed it was somewhere uh in where, in where where this this sort of triangle is that it was what she crossed the border somewhere along that 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 area because there was a little sort of bit of west germany sticking into east germany and she crossed somewhere there. She remembers a train ride, then walking for a bit and crossing the field. After she made it across that field um, safely, and she knew it was possible, um, the next night she went back into uh, East Germany. And the, the night after, brought her mother out, and did the same thing again, brought her grandmother out. She had to carry her grandmother across the field. Um, I said, I said, how, how did you manage to carry a person across the field? And she said, when, 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 when you're that desperate, you can do, you can do anything. You, you, you have the strength. So quite remarkable hearing that kind of thing. Uh, I, I, I would love to, to, um, to find out where people crossed there. I'm, I, I'm next time I'm in that area, I plan to actually try to find people, local historians who might be able to tell me uh, what happened there. But again, every year that passes, uh, more more people like that are are fading away, so I have to hurry. Poland has changed a fair bit over the years, with with the the border border this way and that. For a while, Poland disappeared entirely. Um, something something to that, that we have to remember. This is what Poland and the Poland Lithuanian Commonwealth looked like in in the 1700s, and then things started to pull down, pull down. My my my. Um, ancestral area in where my mother was born was very much in Poland at that time. But by the time my ancestors moved there um, from other 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 parts in, in what's, what's, what is now Poland, it was now part of the, the Russian Empire because the because Poland as a whole was sort of uh, broken up uh, three different times with different pieces going to different uh, different other countries. The idea being that um, the Russians, the Austrians, and the Germans all took bits of Poland and partitioned it. And um, you know, by the, by the time they were finished, there was no more Poland. And uh, that has an impact as well because you're looking look, an impact on genealogy because you're looking at um, it's not just a matter of the border changing. That that is the simple way of looking at it. But the movement of people that resulted, the movement of of um, of people from one area to another. Uh, and there could have been a forced um, effort to 
settle a new area, get people from, from here, force them to go somewhere else. There could also be harassment of people, so people would choose to leave. There could be new religions being imposed on, on people, so they would choose to leave for that reason. Uh, so it's not just a matter of, of the country breaking up. Never th look at it that way. Look at the impact on the people, and and fairly dramatic what what, what happens as as things change and the, the government changes. And now you cannot do that. You have to do that. And if you don't like it, you could be shot. You know, it's it's tough to sort of deal with that. Another map showing the partitions of Poland over the years between 1772 and 1795. Poland disappeared. The bulk of it ended up in in uh, Russia. And uh, uh, it finally sort of came back to life in, in after the First World War in a different area than it was that is now it was pushed further to the east. What does all what does all this stuff mean for genealogy? Um, this is the church uh, that some of my ancestors went to in Posen, which was in Germany in the 1930s. It was a Lutheran church. When I was there in 2003. It was a Catholic church. Again, the same thing. All of the German Lutherans had been forced out. Polish Catholics came in and the church was sort of repurposed again. Major change here is the, the, the top of the church was removed. But I found, looking for photographs more recently, the top is back. It was re, it's been rebuilt, restored. So it's, it's kind of nice to see that, that, that change happen. Uh, Poland between the wars again pushed over to the uh, to the um, to the east included a lot of um, um, Belarus, Lithuania, um, Ukraine, and so on. Um, and it, it was missing the areas um, of um, of Germany that that it acquired after the Second World War. You, you put a put a map like that in in um, in context. You'll see that the you'll, you'll see what the current boundaries are compared to what, what where it was at the time, just just to get a sense of it and uh, how the boundaries have have, have evolved etc over the years. How and you realize what what impact does this have on me? Where might the records be in terms of the different things I'm looking for? Um, if if you're looking for an area that was in Poland but now is in Ukraine, where do you find the records? They could have gone either way. And uh, in many cases, you'll, you'll be checking one or two different archives to find where they, where they are. And different records, you know, church records might not have gone where the land records went and so on and so on. So it takes a bit of extra effort to do it. And who knows what, what, what you'll find. My favorite example, I think, is there were some Lutheran records um, from Zhytomyr in Ukraine that the Lutheran minister took with him when he migrated to Edmonton, Alberta. So you find the original, those original records are in Alberta, Canada, um, just because that's where that's where they went. That's he took those records with him. So it, there can be a bit of a search here, and I've I'm, I've spent a lot of time simply trying to find out which archive might have the records I'm looking for for different churches in different areas. Uh, it's it's worth pursuing. I've been to a lot of archives in Europe, just trying to find whatever I can, and they for the most part they're helpful, except in Latvia they weren't. The, when 1939, uh, Poland was, uh, was sort of broken up again with uh, the Hitler-Stalin invasions happening. Um, and that, that uh, caused forced migration back and forth with, with um, ethnic Poles being, uh, ethnic Germans being forced to move into, the, in, in, into German territory from, from the Eastern part and ethnic Russians, Ukrainians forced to move the other way. Uh, just to sort of make sure that the people who were who were in these areas were people that the authorities thought they could trust effectively. And the there again, there are many maps you can find online that show that show the show the differences there where the where the boundary was between between the German side and the uh, and the and the the Soviet side, and general government was uh, part of the part of the German side. That was the uh, the uh, um, the government operation that they set up to run that part. And then after the war, Poland, as I said, moved over. And you know, again, there are many, many sources online to find where the boundaries were, and where they changed. Um, simply pushing it to the, making it smaller, and pushing it to the west a bit, taking some of the, some of the, the German ter territory and giving back some of the Russian territory effectively. 
And now you look at um, Ukrainian borders, uh, these change all the time. Um, as, as I've said before, um, you know, you, Ukraine, for example, now includes part of the, the old Austro-Hungarian Empire. It includes part of the old Russian Empire. Um, and again, the boundaries are changing all the time simply because um, there's, there's, there are issues with the Russians flexing their mess muscles to a certain extent. So we might see more of that coming. Austro-Hungary Hungary is also a, a different, uh, another, another area to look at, uh, more examples of how borders have changed and information uh, for researchers has, you know, is, is, uh, is affected by this kind of thing. And you have to appreciate in a lot of these areas, it's entirely possible that someone was, was born, married and died in the same place, but in three different countries, because that's the way it happened. Um, borders change that much and so frequently. You might find a reference to, to a place you have to look at the, consider the, the, the year it was taken, year, the, year, the year the information was given to figure out what the boundaries would have been. Again, there are many, many maps and so on online nowadays. It's just, we're living in a wonderful time where you can find so much information on these, these old places. But Austria-Hungary, what it looked like back in the day included a lot of territory that uh, is you know, includes everything from from northern Italy over over into what's now Ukraine, um, and uh, the Czech Republic, um, Slovakia, um, Romania, Austria, uh, so on and so on, Bosnia, Serbia, etc. You find a lot of it there. Uh, a lot of information on 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 how things have changed. Um, again, many 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 maps. And then a map, a map like this that shows how how this one empire is today uh, dramatically different uh, in terms of the the the, uh, uh, the boundaries it has. And, and uh, you know examples of of different things to look at if you're if you're ever interested in the area called Bukovina, um, that's where it was as part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This the, this the relationship to the rest of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, it was split in two, um, with the north going to the uh, to the uh, um, to the uh, to Ukraine and the south going to, going to Romania after the war. And where where you find it uh, today, this is from a Russian atlas that I've got, or sorry, a Ukrainian atlas that I've got. Part of it is in part of it's in Ukraine, part in Romania, and. Uh, so again, where do you find the records? You have to do a bit of extra searching, and and also you have to remember how records are will be will be identified in catalogs. Do you look up people in in uh, do, do you look up the records in in Romanian or, or Ukrainian or Austro-Hungarian, etc.? It it varies, as I say in the handout. It varies depending on the location here or on on the website you're dealing with. Different different organizations have different philosophies on how to do that. The main uh, community there is Chernovitsi. Um, fairly straightforward. There are a lot of maps and so on online that you can find. Google Maps is, is good, but not great. The, the, uh, the map service that I prefer for Eastern Europe, uh, go to pilot.pl. Uh, it has by far the most accurate maps, the most detailed maps for Eastern Europe. That's pilot.pl. And that takes you to a Polish uh, website. That, that should be quite a help to you. And again, looking at modern day, modern day uh, areas, um, you know, the, the, uh, this, this is not quite modern because it's still so Czechoslovakia is, is one, but this goes, gets into more of the, the Romanian um, area. You, and, and with a map like this, you can, you can take it down to find uh, you know, states and counties and so on, uh, which will help you pinpoint where your ancestors were from and what the sources would be. Uh, again, the evolution, um, just, just the old uh, Yugoslavia area, um, how it's changed, how the borders have changed, how this one country of, of Yugoslavia was broken up and became several other countries um, in basically in the past 30 years. It's, it's amazing how quickly things have changed. We, we think the borders are, are so set, but they're not. Finding ancestral locations can be a bit of a challenge, it's, uh, but that's what we do. Like we need, any, any genealogical event, um, be it birth, marriage, death, be it building a new house, getting a new job, or whatever, you need to know two things. You need to know, you need to know the time and place. You need to know where it was and when. 
So when you're dealing with, with ancestral areas where, where there's a lot of movement, you should try to obtain maps from every possible time period, just because things change so much. Um, it'll really, really help you to keep track of what you're, what you're dealing with in the records. Here's one example that I've got from Vernon, British Columbia, a registration of death for a guy named August Tim, and his birthplace was Rofno in Poland. He died in, in um, 1947, as I recall. Um, he came over, came, came to Canada in 1927, um, and he's from Rofno in Poland. Um, but here's the catch. Rofno uh, was not in Poland when he died. It was, in, it was in Poland when he left there, but not when he died. So the record as it stands, a 1947 document saying he was born in Rofno, Poland, was not accurate because Rofno was not in Poland. So, but you look at it and say, well, the information he had, it could be his, the family provide, provided the information based on immigration records or whatever. Um, who knows what, 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 what they had as a reference. Um, but he, the family believed he was from Rofno in Poland, which is not the case. Um, Rovno is in Ukraine, and but it was in Poland between the wars when, when the borders were pushed over some more. So you have to sort of bear in mind history as you as you're dealing with with uh, with old records. Always check the various documents that you've got. This is one that was given to me um, by someone a few years ago. They were looking for help in, in tracking down the place involved. Um, when you get a photograph like this, you, you focus on the relevant stuff, uh, which is the information included. You, ha you have things like the, the name of, the, uh, of, a, of a village there. You've got the date, the name of a village, Busenthal. Uh, the, the church is in Kronau, the path, and, the, and the pastor's name. So you have a, a lot of different clues there to go after. And, and in this case, um, it's, it's deep into Russia, or it's deep into, into Ukraine. Um, we've got a totally different name now, but, but there you have, have the place. It's possible to find a lot of these things because there are so many finding aids available. And you can, you can do a bit of digging, you can, you can look up the name, look up the pastor's name, etc. on just on a, in, a, in a Google search. More often than not, you'll find that somebody has posted something about the family. Um, being in that village and that'll give you a clue as to where to start looking so that was an easy easy find names may vary in terms of spelling in terms of memory in terms of whatever um my mother was born in Valenia. that was the english way of saying it Valenian was the german way but I've, I've seen it in many many other ways and bear in mind quite often when i see it it's in cyrillic so i you know i have to accept a, var a variety of different spellings all the time Galicia in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you'll find different spellings for that. Bukovina, again, different spellings. And these are just, in each of these cases, I just gave three of the most well-known, you know, variations on spelling, simply to, to show, you know, don't be, don't get too, too bogged down and, you know, with, with one spelling. Um, my, the, the, the main, main city in Vilnius, uh, close to where my ancestors lived there, um, was uh, Zhitomer. And I've probably seen um, a dozen ways to spell Jatomer. You know, the I's could be Y's, the 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 Z H could be could be S H, the um, uh, or it could even be J, or, or many. You know, so you throw, throw throw those variations in and then try different try different things. Um, in German, it, it starts with S C H. Uh, so again, you be flexible in searching for this kind of thing. I I have gone on to things like uh, like uh, eBay searches, trying to trying to find locations, and um, maybe there's a photograph, maybe there's a book, maybe there's something. That's where I got the postcard showing the old church in Mackle was in was an eBay auction, um, because you never know what you'll find there. Um, but but be flexible in your spelling to find to get more results. And in the uh, Russian Empire. Uh, they had the local government or, or the regional government was called the Gubernia. Um, and lower, lower center area, you'll see the word Velenia. And that is where my, 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 uh, my ancestors were in. Further over to the left, you'll see Warsaw, uh, Plotsk, uh, Lublin, Radom, etc. That's all in modern day Poland. Uh, that gives you an idea as well. You might find a reference that says 
my family was from X and it, it's actually giving a Gobernia name as opposed to a local name or a state name or, or, a, re, or a, like a full country name, that kind of thing. If you find two or three different names that are that or as locations where the family is from in different documents, you look at them all together and you could, because they all could be pointing to the same place. Just in this case, someone's talking about the village in this place, talking about the city nearby in this place, talking about the county and so on and so on. All of that information is a clue. I've helped people track down from some fairly obscure places by simply looking at everything that I was given and saying, well, it's all pointing here to um, the northern part of Galicia, for example. And always be aware of different languages, just, just different different um, accents, what the sounds that the that letters make. Um, I found this in Chitomer, I was quite surprised because um, I, the Klondike is an area in the Yukon Territory where there was a gold rush in the late 1800s. So why would a casino in Jatomer be called Klondike? Uh, but I've also, uh, in, in Prague one day, a boat going along the river is called the Klondike. So there's something about the name, people like it. But it's important to understand if you're dealing with a country where, where, where English is not the, the language in use, to learn some of those, those, those languages, not the language itself, but how the letters sound. Uh, I can look at to most Cyrillic letters and tell you how they, you know, what, what they sound like and spell out a word, etc. I don't know what the word ne means necessarily, but I can certainly give you the, give you the, uh, the information, you know, from that, what, what I've seen. And that means when I'm in, a, in an archive, for instance, I can be looking through index cards, I can find the cards referencing my, my family, and then get the file, and I've got someone there to translate the file for me. And that, that allows me to do a lot more work. It also means that when I'm in a restaurant in, in Ukraine, I can figure out what's on the menu. And just, just, you know, because a lot of the names are so, are so similar for the foods that they have. I've got a series of uh, historical atlases from many different countries. Uh, this is one from Poland. I've got them from Germany. I've got them from um, Ukraine. I've got um, uh, ones that cover several different countries. Um, you can't have enough of these because you, you never know which, which atlas is going to be the one that really makes the difference to you. So I've been quite careful to get as many as I could. And uh, if I find another one that, that's out there, uh, I, I go for it. You do have to be careful from, at, at times because at one point I bought one from a, an outfit in Germany um, that turned out to be um, way more political, not very much genealogical and bent because there it turned out there was an organization that was arguing that that uh, Germany was the rightful owner of all that land to the east um, and um, so so that's not the uh, a popular uh, thing to be talking about um, in some circles uh, so uh, it was it was a bit remarkable to realize what I was looking at what, the, what, what why, why that map had been put together or why the atlas was put together it was basically to argue in favor of more of giving, giving that land back to Germany. German historical atlases help. Um, and again, this shows modern day, this is one that shows modern day Poland plus some of the, the prior locations, um, the prior names and so on, uh, show, showing how the Volinia area, for instance, was split between Russia and Poland in the, uh, in the interwar years. But it's helpful to see this kind of thing. Um, the, the Genealogical Gazetteer of Galicia, put together by Brian Lenius, is very, very useful if you have people in that area. It's based on some old gazetteers from way back when that are almost incomprehensible and tough to find, but this puts it all into a much more simple format. So it's worth getting if you're interested in Valini or in Galicia. And so, something like this, the Gazetteer of the Kingdom of Hungary. A gazetteer is basically something that provides information on uh, places. It's a, like a, it's a text. Um, it's like a dictionary, but dealing with geography. Uh, so, so it's all a text form of that, but you might find an entry for a town that talks about um, where, it, where it is, how big it is, um, lo location compared to other places, uh, where, where local uh, registration offices would be, where the post office is, the railroad, that kind of thing. So, so these can help give you, give you clues as to where to find more of your family members. 
And I've got several books on name changes because it's important to keep track of, um, of how names have changed. One of the standard atlas or gazetteers for Germany is called Meyers Orts. Um, they published several different editions over the years. It's a standard reference work. The 1912 edition is a standard reference work. I have other, uh, I've got that, and I've got two other editions that I picked up from, uh, from bookshops in, in Germany. And I've got one book that's around 80 pages long that just includes name changes um, after one of the ones was put out. Within three years, they had an 80 page book talking about name changes within Germany. So don't think that things are static. They never are. There's one village in, in, um, in Ukraine close to where my mother was born. It had six names, six different names during the 20th century. And the last time I looked at that area on Google Maps, I saw they've changed the name since I was there last. So now we're talking seven names um, you know, in, in 125 years. Remarkable. This book I, I find very, very useful. And this is the kind of book you can usually find in a used bookstore for about a dollar. Um, people don't see the value in this, but it does in, include a lot of good information um, on name changes, on pl where places are, that kind of thing. It's well worth picking up, checking for it online, etc. Uh, and again, it's one of the cheapest books I own, one of the most used books I have. When you're recording the place names, um, beware. You've got, to, you've, you've got to really pay attention to, to the changes in in, uh, in names over the years and respect those changes. Here's um, some of the some some um, some um, references from ancestry uh, for people in my family, um, posted by by distant relatives and so on. Um, in in 1936, it wasn't it wasn't uh, Wojciechy in in Verminsk, Mazursky, Poland. It was, it was still Albrechtsdorf in Preussisch Eilau in Germany in 1886, same thing. So they, they took the modern, modern name for that place and applied it to the old record. I prefer to use the record that was, or the name that was used at the time the record was created, but then certainly have notes of some sort to say it, it has changed now. Um, here's the birth in 1885 in Albrechtsdorf, which is correct, that's the proper name for the time. Uh, Ermland is Missouri uh, in, in Poland, which is wrong. That's, it wasn't in Poland in 1885. Um, 1888, Albrecht Preussisch Eilo, aus Preussen, Preussen, Deutschland. That's correct. That works. So, that, so, so the, 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 for the firstborn, wrong, but for later on, first had it right. When you're searching for, um, uh, for, for a place like, like, uh, like Scheffler, which is one of my ancestral names, is searching for Albert Storff and Preussisch Eilau. No match is found. So why not? I find, uh, so I, I then look, look to see what, what I could find, and there is Scheffler and born in Wojciechy, which again is wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, so they had the stuff on Oregon correct, but they didn't have the stuff back there correct. And the, the shared family trees and so on. Again, you've got to be so careful when you're seeing the references to different places because that could be someone's interpretation based on what. It could be based on family information that was handed down. It could be, you know, someone using a different time period than what, uh, than what you would be expecting to find. So be careful with that kind of thing. Make sure that you record things properly and, and, uh, and, and but also be ready to check the variations on names. The other variation is to see if you can find other people that way. Here we have um, several people born in Eilau, House Hose Eilau, um, which is which is okay, except except that um, there were two Eilaus in in Ostpreußen. One was one was Deutsch Eilau, one the other was Preussisch Eilau. So which one is it? You got to you got to say one or the other. So so by trying to eliminate part of it, make it more, more correct, I guess, they made it wrong. Finally, or close to finally, one of the, um, the, the best, um, best things I've seen, uh, I've been doing research for a long, long time, and this is one of the best things I've seen for marriage certificates. And it's relevant to borders um, only because it's a, the guy, the guy who was married was a border guard. So 
Um, but I just couldn't resist showing it because I think it's the most amazing thing I've seen. Uh, simple terms, um, my family, that branch of the family uh, lived in a place called Tietz in, uh, in Brandenburg, which is just to the uh, north uh, west of Berlin. And on the far side of the country, uh, on the border um, with uh, the Netherlands, is a place called Walbeck. It's driving on the Autobahn today at seven hours between, between those two places. I wouldn't have thought of looking that far afield, but with the searches we can do nowadays, you're finding people that you never would have found even 10 years ago. But um, it's one of my family, distant family members ended up in Walbeck. Walbeck. An old map showing, showing Walbeck, um, very, very close to the border with, uh, with, the, uh, with the Netherlands. Um, we're almost right down the middle of the screen, you will see sort of the, dot, the black dotted line, a broken line. Uh, that is the border with the Netherlands uh, right there. And it was in Walbeck that, uh, that uh, these two people were married, um, Gotthilf Freudenberg and uh, Margareta Henrietta Lux were married. That is what the document looks like, the full document looks like. It's absolutely stunning to see how much information is there on that document. Such as all of this. He was a widower, where he was born, what his job was, where he was living, uh, his age, his baptism. He was the son of uh, someone who died in 1834. His mother died in, 19, in 1842, where they lived. His first wife, lists, he lists his first wife how old she was uh, when she died in 1846. And then who he married, Margareta Henrietta Lux. She was 24, where she was born, when she was baptized, um, the, the names of her parents and her father's profession. All of that in one absolutely amazing marriage document. And the reason I throw this in is it was on the border. I just thought I couldn't resist, I have to show this one somewhere. I've never seen this kind of information, this complete information um, I've seen some Polish records that have almost addendums saying the, the death of the first wife, that kind of thing, but never detail like this I've seen before. Some more border adventures. Uh, what, you know, some of, the, some of the, the fun I've had over the years. Uh, a few years ago, I, I drove from Frankfurt to Kiev. Um, normally you fly, but I wanted to drive, I wanted to see, the, see get the, you know, stop at many, many different spots along the way. Um, see the sites, see how it changes as you get more towards uh, Ukrainian territory. And after the, the, uh, the, the, the city of Helm, I started seeing a lot of billboards with Cyrillic lettering on it because those were aimed at the, at the um, uh, at people heading into Ukraine. The border itself was an experience. This is part of what it looks like. Um, Stopped at the first uh, the first border border um, stopped at the first booth and thought, wow, um, that was really quick. That only took about twenty minutes. I thought it'd be a lot longer than that. Um, had to pop the trunk, pop the hood in case I was smoking something under the hood, show ID, etc. Everything was searched and checked and all that kind of thing. I thought, wow, that's amazing. Uh, I thought it would take a lot longer than that. Um, what I didn't realize at the time was that that was the first of six places I had to stop to get across that border, three in Poland, three in, in Ukraine. So it took more than three hours to get across that border. Um, uh, at the time, I was following, for a lot of the time, I was following a couple of vehicles that were kind of interesting. Um, Ukrainian um, vehicles um, with uh, used appliances. That's a Lada with a couple of appliances on the roof, uh, one in the trunk, and there was another in the back seat. And I'm not allowed to take photographs there, so I did this very, very discreetly. But um, just seeing, getting a slice of, of, of life, I didn't see any vehicles like that on the polar side, any on the Ukrainian side, I saw several at the border itself. So do they get across the border and unload and into a truck or whatever, and then go back for more? I don't know. But it was just remarkable to see that, to get a sense of what life is, as I say, what life is like for that, those people. Uh, a few years after that, I went to, uh, to Riga, rented a car in Riga, and then drove down, aiming to go into, um, uh, into Poland. Um, and so I was on the coast, 
point where you go over to the to the to the Pimbalta coast and then down through there through um, Nemo which is now Klaipeda that kind of thing and um, um, I the the the, um, the GPS was telling me the, the best way to get there was to go through uh, the Kaliningrad the Kaliningrad Oblast which would which would be shorter it would also be um, a lot more time consuming because of stopping at the border and all of the effort and I would need a visa to get into into Russia. Um, there are other other sites that were a bit smarter so so like one of these was Google Maps the other was uh, was uh, via Michelin which is a site I use a lot for for Europe. Um, it was a smarter one it said go around go around Dave don't go through it. Um, and it, it, it also made sense because I wanted to see what it was like going around it, um, some, some of the countryside. And especially one certain area, right on the corner, right on the, on the spot where, where, where three countries come together, it's Poland on the bottom, Russia on the, on the left-hand side, Lithuania on the right-hand side. Um, I wanted to see what that, that, that area looked like because it was it's very, very historic. As you're getting closer and closer to the to to that one spot, all of these border you know, do not entry signs were, were were all along the side of this of the road. So I've got photographs of some of those, and they're basically saying, you know, this is the federal border. Do not cross, as 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 the one near near uh, Korsis Eilau also says. Um, right at that spot, um, that was the most interesting spot for me, and I'll show you why. Um, right where that dot is, uh, very, very close to the border, incredibly close to the border. That was also the border way back when of the border between the, the, um, the German Empire and the Russian Empire, which I thought was pretty cool. So right, up, right on that, that, that very spot, I'm crossing from, from, the, from the German side into the Russian or the Russian into the German, depending which way you're going. So. Uh, you're going from one of the old historic empires into the other, just just as a as a, and, and now it's you know there's no sign to indicate that you just have to know that hey that's what you're crossing, and and the, where the dot is that is right where the border crossing was, and now it's all changed because further north it's uh, it's the, it's uh, part of Russia. It's amazing to think that back in the day at that point you were crossing if you were heading east, you were going into Russia. Now, if you're heading west, you go into Russia. If you're west and north, you go into Russia. Russia has moved from one side to the other about that one location. And you think it'd be something really quite dramatic and so on, but it's not. It's just a, just a spot on the road with a sign saying, don't, don't go in there. Um, but right there is where the, where the boundary was between the two empires. Uh, nowadays, they seem to have opened up a bit. I got this one off um, off Google Street Views. Uh, now there is the sign saying, um, don't enter, it's the border. But there's also a walking trail that leads right into the border. So you can, you can actually go in and take a, take a close look and be a stand on the spot where, where you're in three different countries at one time. And I guess you don't need a visa for that. And finally, another border example. This has changed. I believe there's now a fence all along here. This is this is a the border between Washington State and British British Columbia, uh, close to Vancouver, and the information. This is off Google Street Views. The information in the corner, upper right left hand corner, is a lie, because you are on the Canadian side. You can tell you're on the Canadian side because the the, the speedometer says 50 kilometers an hour, or the the, the the speed limit sign is 50 kilometers an hour, not 30 miles an hour. Um, so you're on the Canadian side, yet up above, Google was confused. It thought you were in Linden, Washington. Um, to be in Washington State, you'd have to cross that ditch and, and to, be in, to be in Washington State. Um, so again, be careful when, when you're dealing with borders, be aware of the, of the changes and so on over the years. Again, the handout is uh, on daveobie.com. Uh, good information there. And I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dave. Um, if you have any questions right now, uh, please enter them in the chat. Um, I'll ask a question right now. Um, so for people who are just starting out with family history and researching in other countries, what advice would you give? And like what like number one tip would you give them? 
if they're just starting out research, researching in other countries, get as much information as you can before you start looking in that other, like, like wherever you are right now, get all the information from your local sources about the family. Um, and that might be immigration records or census records, whatever, anything that gives a clue as to where the family is from. Church records might say where the person was baptized, christened, whatever. Uh, you might find information like that. So gather the, the local information first before you start you know, trying to, trying to dig overseas. I've had too many people over the years um, trying to jump across too quickly. Um, in one case, someone came up to me and asked how they could find uh, their ancestor in Manchester, England. And I said, I asked obvious questions such as how old was the person, when was he born, et cetera, et cetera. And this person knew none of that. I said, when did they come to North America? They had no idea. And, and I said, well, why are you trying to go across the water now without getting all the information on this side that'll help you get the information on that side? And he finally admitted I was right. He might've just wanted me to shut up, but he did tell me that yes, he would go and deal with all that stuff, get, get this stuff on this side of the water first. And then you can cross with some confidence that you're going to, going to the right area. And when you find people like in one in on my dad's side, in one in one uh, one small town in in um, in Hampshire in England, I've got there are, the census shows five people named John Baker. Only one of them is mine. Um, but the clues I have on this side of the water told me the age and the profession of the one and the one to look for. So you get that information first. Awesome, thank you. Um, we have a question in the Q&A from Dan Graves asking on your travels um, and you were driving, was it a rental? Where did you stay daily? Um, it, was a, it was a rental car and I stayed, I, I've always stayed with um, um, at hotels with secure parking or with friends. I've got people in, in Ukraine who I can park, park the car in, in their locked, uh, locked yard, that kind of thing. Uh, the rental companies um, are relatively willing. When I first wanted to do it, they wouldn't let me take the car into, into Poland even, but now I had no problem last time. I said I was going to Ukraine, they said no problem. Um, but, but the thing is I'm responsible for the car. So if it gets stolen, it's, I pay for it. Um, but, but again, I, I knew I had secure parking lined up. I knew that it was, it was all figured out in advance. Um, yeah, it, it's, I had another thought, but I forgot entirely, sorry. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's actually, fair. it's really cool to do that and to experience going over there in a car and driving out all that way because you're dealing with the locals and you're seeing much, much different sort of thinking. Like, like, like on, uh, driving on a two lane road in Poland, for instance, um, it's challenging at first because when, when someone wants to pass someone else, they just pull out and pass. And you, the person coming towards them, you pull onto the, you pull onto the the shoulder, and and it works. The locals the locals do it, do it that way. So it takes you a while. And then the first time you actually try it yourself, you're scared. Then you realize it does work. Thanks. Um, we have another question from Dan Graves in Germany. How do I find documents prior to the unification of the city states? Um, it it really depends which one you're talking about. Or what area? So you know, the, the first thing I would do would be checking with local archives to see what there is. And if you're talking about documents from from uh, from churches or, or or other documents of of one form or another, the local archives would always be the place to start because they could tell you you know where to find the information you're looking for. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Um, those are all of our questions. We have a lot of thank yous in the chat. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for that wonderful webinar. I learned so much about Europe. Um, okay. And um, thank you for everybody for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which will be, um, I forgot to share my screen, um, which will be on January 27th, um, optimizing your searches on the internet. It's more than family search and ancestry with Maureen Brady, same time, same link. Um, and a recording of this webinar will be made available next week and you can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week. Thanks everyone. See you next time.